So we reached the last speaker now, um, Jakob Hanna from the Weizmann Institute. And um, Jakob will talk about a problem that has haunted um, mouse um, embryologists ever since the 1950s and 60s when it became possible to cultivate eggs, actually. It's hard to keep these embryos longer in culture, such as to be able to look at all stages. And that's what he's going to tell us. So first of all, thank you very much, uh, Denny, for organizing this uh, really wonderful symposium. And also the discussions around it's really fun. So um, I'll talk to you today uh, about a little bit what and why we're trying to do some of the stuff we are uh, doing in my lab. And um, my lab, uh, the Weizmann Institute, we're interested in understanding uh, early developmental potency and uh, stem cell potential. That's what we've been working on. And as many of you know that during early development, these transitions, whether it's from the zygote and the morula and the blastocyst, um, there are a lot of drama happening, whether you're talking about DNA methylation, uh, reduced and, react and then increased, or X chromosome inactivation, reactivation, and so forth. And these things are very hard to study because you have very little material, things happen fast, even in the single cell era, it's very hard to do biochemistry, let alone if you're trying to talk about anything that is not mouse, that it really becomes impossible. So these are the questions we deal, and of course add on that, that the fact we can also grow stem cells out of these embryos, and pluripotent cells are basically, we have to remind ourselves, are an artifact, which is this state is transient, pretty present for one or two days in vivo and then goes away. This is very different from adult stem cells in our body. And over the years, uh, research from many different groups, including mine, led to the understanding really that pluripotency is not a binary zero versus one kind of state, but it can have like different flavors. Some of them are very, very different. And I would say there are like two neighborhoods. You have the pluripotent cells that are termed as naive cells, which correspond more to early pre-implantation cells. Um, um, they have more early developmental markers, or, or for example, X chromosome is, is still at, both of these are active, versus you have the pluripotent cells at the post-implantation stage. They're not differentiated. They still have OCT4, the pluripotency marker, but they're about to differentiate, and they have different marker genes. They have, uh, for example, DNA methylation is already up. X chromosome is inactive. So there are many different differences. But really, you could ask, you know, who, who cares? Uh, stem cells are stem cells, and why, what, what, what is, is there really a functional consequence for these comparisons? And I think one of the most striking uh, examples was really the beautiful work from Mitenori Saito uh, 11 years ago now, is that he described really make authentic PGCs, and PGCs are the primordial germ cells. And of course, this paper focused on making the PGCs and characterizing them, but if you look at the caref protocol very carefully, it's very exciting because he has to start with naive cells that are ERK signaling inhibited. Then he has to give priming for 48 hours with FGF active in, what's called priming, similar perhaps to what happens in the embryo. And then he has to give BMP4 pulse, which induces the PGCs. And then if you look at the markers, basically it gets these double positive blimp one and Stella population. So you had to really carefully follow the sequence in order to be successful. And we've looked at this in two different ways. One is, can we you know, repeat this with humans, the same protocol? And many groups did, and it didn't work with human cells. And, have, and it was thought that perhaps the differentiation protocol needs to be very different. But actually, we realized, well, perhaps not, it was that with the human stem cells, we do not have these early pre-implantation cells. So in parallel, we are working and asking why are there so many differences between the human and mouse cells, and perhaps are there different human pluripotent cells? Um, and over the years, I think we've kind of promoted the understanding that also in humans, you can have these primed and naive stem cells. And I would say the m major divider between these two populations is how they tolerate inhibition of ERK signaling. Naive cells really can maintain and actually prosper in the inhibition of ERK signaling versus prime cells do not. And that's, I would say, the major split between them. And I will not get into this, but over the years we've developed defined media that is transgene-free, that uses different uh, defined cytokines and feeder-free to regrow really these naive cells that they still maintain genetic integrity and they can differentiate properly. 
Um, and the latest one is what we call Handsome Media and published in, two, uh, in 2021 that we really routinely use for, a lot, for, for our work, but I will not talk about it today. But just to mention, once we had any of these naive conditions and went back to the CYTO protocol, so now we start with naive cells, we give them 48 hours of priming and then give BMP4, and we found that in humans the same protocol works. And so you can get PGCs quite efficiently from human naive cells, but not from human primed cells. And going back, I think that the really interesting questions, which we do not know at the moment, is why is starting with naive cells is so essential? Why is priming is essential as well? And also, if there is a prolonged priming, meaning more than 48 hours, also, this is detrimental to the outcome. So there is kind of seems to be a window of opportunity being open in this pathway. And we worry that what's happening here is actually can be relevant to many other differentiation protocols that you can have a really an influence, positive or negative, on the differentiation outcome. And that's why basically we now trying to understand what is the functional consequence of if I perturb something in a naive pluripotent cells, then go to the primed my readout will be the soma or the organ formation. And we are lacking this continuation, really, I would say, in, in in vitro systems and also in in vivo, because it, we don't have a system to really follow the, the blastocyst, making the epiblast and looking at the embryo in a continuation um, um, in a robust way. Um, so it's not only an in vitro problem, it is also, I would say, an in vivo problem. And again, yes, this is again, brought us to look at this, what's called the uterine barrier, is that we can, in mouse and humans, grow beautifully embryos until the blastocyst stage, and this is the basic of all IVF, but actually once the implantation happens, and this is basically where all the interesting drama that we've heard all day long about gastrulation, organogenesis, happens right after implantation. It happens very quickly in the mouse and the human. And then this is happening really inside the uterus, which we are not able to grow for prolonged periods of time. Uterus is non-transparent, it's inaccessible, we do not control the environment quite well. And therefore, we started thinking, can we just a little bit push more, maybe one or two days get out of this and be able to learn more about development? So a lot has been said about gastrulation and really, I think, the importance of, of different models, whether you're talking about, uh, of course, zebrafish, and that became very important because these embryos do not grow inside the uterus, which makes them much more accessible. But I would say there's also a question for us that was, in, in, in principle, is really can mammalian gastrulation be captured entirely and normally, I would say, outside the uterus? Can mammalian organogenesis be captured outside the uterus, or is it actually the uterus is inductive and irreplaceable? And can these two processes actually be combined together and captured, which was, a, a, I think, a, a question that hasn't been shown before. And at the technical level, as I mentioned, we are not able to grow for a prolonged period of time post-implantation embryos. And also, we're stuck with the fact that if we take out a post-implantation embryo, let's say we take out a day seven or day eight mouse embryo, we cannot transfer it to another mouse even. So we cannot take the theoretical experiment where I would take a, a post-implantation embryo, mutate it, and follow the same embryo over time. So we are very limited with that. And again, so we, we cannot also control as much as we'd like the environment and the exposure, whether we're talking about light or metabolites that is surrounding the embryo. And these are all limitations of in utero growth. So as you know by now, there are well-established protocol for uh, making blastocysts, work from different groups, including Magdalena Zarnica gets about implantation cultures, I should say. Also with the human work from Ali Rivanlu here is beautiful. Um, but I should say also these protocols have, have delays in time, but they are very they can recapitulate great periods of time. But what about post implantation? As you mentioned really great work has been done before. Um, back already the earliest paper we could find was in 1934. A very prominent player was Dennis New from Cambridge, Patrick Tam, of course, that made different systems. And one of them is, is this rotating culture incubator that, that you're seeing here. But the problem with these systems is that they took the incubator, basically, and they just connected it to a 100% oxygen balloon, basically. So it's very, very rough systems. Um, but they were very useful. They were able to get 
a day or one and a half day growth. So you can grow an embryo like from day eight and a half to nine and a half or from nine to 10. But the efficiency also was very low, uh, below 10%. Most embryos were abnormal. Therefore, these systems were not widely really in the end adopted. Really beautiful work from, for example, from Rosa Beddington was done using these systems, for example, to show an ectopic axis formation. Again, so these are experiments that are more rough in a way. You don't need a totally not natural, normal embryo to show this. But what we were trying to, to get is really as much as possible normal embryogenesis and much more that, so we can look at more finer events during development. So our approach is really trying to think, OK, we need to really control a lot of parameters very carefully surrounding the embryo. And we thought of basically to build a machine. It's a little bit like a ventilation machine, but we're not, we don't want to ventilate the embryo's lungs, but it's mostly the surroundings of the embryo. So through different iteration, iterations that we developed in-house, basically this is what we started building, where we have the incubator part. And then we have a controller device that controls whatever parameters we are going to sense. And then we have the gas mixing box where things get basically pumped and measured and then flown to the incubator. And slowly we started getting into more detail. So what is going to be in each compartment and which controllers we want to have. And in the end, this is basically what the addition we add on this, which is the, you know, it looks, doesn't look nice because it's something we make in our own garage in a way. But it's just an electronically controlled uh, um, box that really carefully looks at different parameters that I will now, as we learned along the way. And um, what are things that we learned? So it was a journey, basically, we started just going by increasing the number of days we can grow the embryos and the efficiency we can grow the embryos and getting normal embryos. Um, one thing was really the O2 regulation, which was quite important in the sense that when, for some protocols, we couldn't just go persistently 20% O2. There was very, very critical need for a gradual increase in O2. Atmospheric pressure, which was a, a, a very important thing of maintaining about 6.5 PSI pressure. It's, it's, it's a big change for these embryos. I must say, I don't know whether this is because it's mimicking the little increased pressure that exists inside the uterus. And there are nice papers showing about how the Reichart membranes actually around the embryo maintains that pressure. Or it could be that the pressure is also, again, happening like in a ventilation machine, because when you oxygenate a patient, the tension of the O2, it makes it better for diffusion. I cannot know, but what I can say that this is very, very critical. Um, Phototoxicity, it's a one euro solution, but we have to have a black cloth over the incubator. If we leave them overnight with light, they don't like it. And the other thing is that the embryos are very, very, very sticky. So that's, you know, as we try to use static conditions, so I'll show you for different parts, but the embryo is very sticky. And once it's, if it sticks, it just very easily gets distorted. And one other thing is this humidification, this bubble bottle to really maintain humidification for these parameters. So, um, this is when the system is, is running, so, so this is when it's working, and then you, each embryo is growing inside the liquid, and then we, this is something else which we had to develop, which is the media that is being optimized to grow the embryos. And there, we've learned that we needed to have a combination of rat serum and human serum. We couldn't use either one. Also, I'll show you the high glucose, maintaining at least four milligrams uh, per ml is, is critical for this process. And uh, just a little technical parameter, uh, which is also how we isolate the serum. Byproducts of hemolysis are really toxic to the embryo. So it's very, very important just when we get the blood, just make sure we isolate the blood in the first two or three hours. And then we can freeze it for two years, absolutely no problem. But if you just leave it sitting there, you'll get this start, heparin is not completely blocking it, and just will give you just terrible results. And this is what we started. We started taking out day seven and a half embryos, which is late gastrulation. And you can see within one day, actually, the yolk sac is dramatically growing. We can see formation of the cardiac looping with the heartbeat. One day later, we can see actually the embryo turning with the head and the legs. The next day, day three, which you can see the heart beating with the blood uh, system. So this is the embryo's uh, blood. And then they reach day, basically, E11 at day four, and then they die, and I'll talk about, it's basically the die from placental insufficiency. The efficiency of, from going from 7.5 is, um, is over 75%, and again, we talk about not nor, um, normally developed embryos. 
Uh, so we have very, very stringent criteria for that. Um, and I should mention that we're um, developed, we've put these lot of videos on our website and we have a Jove and just a, little bit, a lot of technicalities of about how we um, assemble the media or how do we um, feed the embryos, basically just move them every day to a new bottle that has the media. Um, just different technicalities that just, just handling it quite, uh, nothing rocket science really, but uh, it has to be done right. And, and here, just to show you examples, like what happens if you, so the efficiency is very high, but we just need to do the correct parameters we optimize. So the control is now, this is the optimized conditions with the glucose and the pressure that I showed you. So what happens if you don't have this 6.5 PSI, you can see the embryos, you get embryos, but they are abnormal. If you don't have sufficient glucose, you will get abnormal embryos. If you get permanent 21.02 when you're starting from 7.5, uh, 7 you get abnormal embryos. So the, the things need to be, um, the, the, the embryos are, are sensitive to this. So we started this long process of really comparing in utero versus a cutero embryo at every day. I can see dissected and undissected embryos. And we were quite surprised and pleased to see that they were actually normally developing embryos. There was no delay uh, and there was no decrease in the somite number between the embryos. Towards the end, you get a little bit of cardiac edema. It's around the heart, it's not the heart itself growing, but this is known, as I'll show you, this is what happens because they're dying from placental insufficiency. Then we started really looking at different 11 markers, carefully side by side, looking at as there any delay or perturbation in spatiotemporal expression of these markers. And we didn't see that. We, we, we looked very carefully during, also as well as light sheet microscopy, and the embryos were, were normally developing. We took different reporter lines just to see, so also, can we recapitulate reactivation of like a GFP of uh, Wnt1 Cree, for example, um, the, and we can see that it comes on at day two, at day nine and a half, which is equivalent to what happens in utero. Again, showing that we can use reporters and, and we're recapitulating things that are occurring inside the uterus. So that was exciting for us, but not enough because day seven and a half is late gastrulation. And you could still argue, well, you still need the uterus to induce gastrulation properly and only then you can carry it further. So I really wanted to be able to do this from E5 and a half and six and a half, uh, which is pre, five and a half is the pre-gastrulation. And there, actually, when we took the embryos at five and a half and we put them in the roller culture, we get, as you can see, abnormal embryos. We couldn't get normal embryos. And we went back and we thought maybe just we need just static conditions, and that was the case. So we used the same media we developed, but we just used simple IBD plates, which are um, just uh, plates that are typically used for embryos in IVF clinics. Um, but it works in a lot, basically, every, almost every indented here and plate we used. And you can see we can get gastrulation from six and a half, also from five and a half, very, very efficiently from these conditions. It's very, very robust. And actually, because this is happening in static conditions, you can see these um, uh, considerably red labeled embryos. We tether the ectoplacental cone uh, on the top, and you can see also the yolk sac growing. You can see the primitive streak formation and the somite uh, progressing over these videos, which are about, if I remember, about 58 hours of, of growth. Again, it's showing that robustness that these embryos, uh, that they really like these uh, conditions that what we place them in. Again, we, we did uh, a phenotypical analysis, the size, the staining, and, and the embryos were normal. But we started wanting to have an unbiased way, and which is single cell RNA-seq analysis for these embryos. And you can see we compared, in this case, the eight and a half uh, in utero versus ex utero. You can see that the, basically, the cell types are all present there. We don't have extra populations. We don't have missing populations. The annotations we also compare to outside data sets by Bertie Gottigans, and, and the embryos are, are basically normal. Then we looked, when do we combine this? And we found that if we transfer the embryos at eight and a half, we actually also do it at seven and a half from the static to the roller culture conditions, we can then go all the way, whether it's going from six and a half to day 11 at a 55% efficiency, or from day five and a half, we can get normal embryos at about 20% efficiency in these conditions. We did, again, the stainings and all the analysis. I'll show you here again the single cell RNA-seq data set. And again, when we look at these embryos at day 10 and a half, 
um, that they have all the populations uh, around them that as natural embryos. If we look at the different cluster in about abundance, is there a difference in the abundance of the cell types? As you can see only three subtypes with asterisks are marked are small differences, about one or two percent, but it's very, very minor, I would say, in, in these cases. Um, what if we look at the actual cell types? So for each cluster, do we look at differences in gene expression for cell types between in utero and exutero grown embryos? And we can see minor differences only in two gene lineages, which is the primitive uh, erythroids and cardiomyocytes. And this is kind of nice because the embryos are, di are dying from what's called hydrox fetalis or placental insufficiency. So the embryo starts because there is no, in the end, is relying on diffusion and nutrition in the system. And what happens also in babies, when there's placental insufficiency, the embryo starts to compensate by two ways, by making more erythrocytes and by the heart working very, very hard. And in the end, they have heart failure, and that's why they have the edema. So we're seeing a lot of these stress genes basically coming on one day before these embryos die. So basically, um, we can just to appreciate the change not only in the morphology we're getting, in, but also in the change of the, of the size of these embryos. And I want to say, yes, I don't use the word artificial uterus at all for, for a reason, because I'd like, again, to give the credit to the embryo. I just, the way I sense this is that the embryo has the ability to do this, and we just need to give it the right environment, do not interfere with it, or get, get the hell out of its way, that's the way I call it, and it's able to basically propagate correctly outside the uterus. So, that was one part, but as I, told, as, I, as I mentioned, we're trying to develop a method, um, a platform, basically, to do the experiment. And as I mentioned, our dream experiment is really to take an early embryo and mutate it and follow it over time ex utero. So for that, we developed the methods where quite easily we can take a lentivirus, whether it's uh, carrying an, an innocent GFP or a CRISPR, of course, and inject with one microliter in the proamniotic cavity at day 6.5, then we can grow them for five days in the static and the roller culture conditions. And you can see the embryos, this is just GFP, the embryo is labeled very, very efficiently. We almost see no reduction in the efficiency or abnormality. So the, the, the embryos really tolerate this manipulation quite well. Another manipulation that can be done is brain electroporations. Typically, this method is done in utero on, on day 12 and a half embryos. The scientists open up the uterus and they can electroporate DNA into one side of the brain. Here we can do it earlier, so we can take day seven and a half, grow them uh, for until day eight and a half, and then electroporate and grow for three extra days. And you can see again the embryo show this GFP integration or other markers we've inserted um, on one side of the brain, showing that we can do electroporations also quite efficiently. Now. One annoying thing about our system is that when we have a roller culture conditions, it's very hard to do imaging because it's moving. However, at F, this media that we developed allows us at any time point to move to static conditions and be able to mount the embryo on a microscope and the images for up to 36 hours. So for example, this embryo was from roller culture from day seven and a half until day nine. And then at day nine, we put it in and use the same media on a confocal microscope, and we can um, um, image basically the, the closure of the neural tube uh, formation, which is uh, just like as was described before by Linus Wonder with this uh, zipper-like movement. Another proof of principle is really to be able to show that the embryo can be influenced by known met uh, metabolic or drugs. One of them is this teratogen valproic acid, which causes neural tube defect. And very quickly, when we add VPA uh, outside, you can see that the embryos develop the classical known neural tube defects in this embryo, again, showing that we can just simply, by adding something to the media, we can view uh, the effect uh, on these embryos that are growing. Another uh, option was we use we, really how they do they tolerate a micro injection of certain cell types. And in this case, we took human derived microglia cells, which are basically supportive uh, macrophage cells, and they are GFP labeled. And we can inject them into day seven and a half. And you can see here the embryos right after the injection. So they're they actually tolerate it very quite well, and then we put them in the static at the rural cultural conditions. And you can see that the microglia cells are the GFP cells, and then after three days, they are, they look, they, they're known to enter the brain from the hindbrain region, so this is actually at this stage where we expect them to be. 
And if you look at the bottom part, we stain them for human pneuma specific antigens. So this is antibody that specifically binds the human cells. So the GFP cells are the human cells, and they are in a non human organism, which is in this case the mouse. Um, and starting now to a little bit make use of this pro uh, system, which we originally developed. And as I told you, we're trying to understand differences between naive and prime cells. And one of the things we couldn't evaluate in the field very well is how well do prime cells uh, able to make chimeras when they are injected in vivo? Now, of course, you don't want to inject them in blastocyst because this is not the match stage. And if you inject them into day six and a half or seven and a half embryo in the old methods, you can only grow them for one day. And one day is very little time to really see if there is robust integration. And what we did, we took prime cells, um, what's called mouse EPCs. We've actually also took these short-term 48 hours primer I mentioned to you. But actually, in both cases, and we've tried injection quite extensively, whether it's posterior or distal or anterior parts of the embryo. And you can see, you can see the GFP-labeled cells integration. They differentiate as described before. But always, the contribution is very, very low. We could never get really high contribution chimeras. And now you could argue, maybe there is a technicality, so this platform is not good for it. Um, sorry, so this is the quantification that the, the numbers are very quite low. But here you see the comparison. What happens if we take an epiblast in vivo that is labeled with red, we dissociate it, and then inject it and put it in the system. And in this case, you could see very high contribution chimeras. So again, which leads us to the conclusion that for some reason, the prime pluripotent cells we are growing in vitro are not that good at doing this job. And this is, they are not really functionally equivalent to the day seven and a half OCT4 positive epiblast, which functionally, if we inject them and grow them to day 11, they can make very high contribution chimeras. And this kind of makes me wonder, you know, are there alternative prime pluripotent cells and that we should be looking at? And what do these cells represent, really? Um, which I don't have an answer for. Um, just a bit where, where we are uh, trying to proceed with this. So we would like a little bit to extend this analysis both by starting from an earlier time point in development. Um, because if we, uh, um, uh, it would give us a lot of robustness to be able to start with blastocysts, um, particularly if we also want to move to other species. Um, but also we're trying to extend later on. And one, one thing we would like at least to reach day 13 and a half because it's um, I would say end of uh, organogenesis, and basically which is marked by the limb development. So with that, we have a, a kind of a newer generation incubator, which is able to have both hypoxia and high oxygen levels, basically in both. And so far, we actually say that we are able to reach day 13 and a half embryos um, quite well. Uh, and you can see that they have more marked eye development, they have more marked um, uh, limb development. We're still characterizing them, but we're quite happy that this. Um, that this can progress further. So to summarize, I hope I've convinced you that we've basically, um, perhaps I would say, revived or revamped uh, a platform that we think is, is important that kind of take us a bit more to the next level of, of looking at embryos uh, outside the uterus, whether to study um, cell transplantation, whether to do more fancy live imaging at different stages, um, of course, looking at tissue mechanics or extra embryonic tissue development which I think can be done much better with this system. To look at chimerism, we're talking about mouse stem cells that I showed here, or different human cells with this cross-species chimerism topic. I think this is an important platform because usually the efficiencies are very low, and if we want to understand why something fails, this can be the system with. Of course, with the ability to make rapid mutagenesis and follow the outcome, I think we're going to be able to better study gastrulation and the genetic implications involved in it. And the last thing that we are excited about in this system is we wonder whether it will help making synthetic embryos proceed further. So we've heard a lot, when, and in general, whether we're talking about gastroloids or blastoids, or, um, and so we are not able basically to evaluate a lot of these embryos because, as I told you before, even if you had a natural post-implantation embryo, if, if you put it inside the uterus, it doesn't progress. So if you, and until I think this paper, so if you can't grow a natural inside, embryo outside the uterus, how are you going to grow a synthetic embryo outside the uterus? So in other words, 
what I've showed you so far, I think for us is now becoming the positive reference control. We now have the conditions that we know to grow natural embryos. And the question is, what if we, how if we take stem cells or different organoids or different synthetic embryos and place them in these conditions, will we get better structure or embryo-like structures? And we think these platforms allow better to address or even improve the potential of, of such embryos. With that, I want to thank um, Alejandro Aguilera and uh, Bernardo Oldak, very talented PhD student in the lab that did this work. Um, a staff scientists and our collaborators as well from Rambam Hospital, uh, different funding agencies. And uh, I'll finish by just saying also we're always looking for very talented uh, postdocs and PhD students to join our lab. And I would like also to just advertise, it's the wrong date actually, but we've been trying for the last three years to have a meeting on early embryogenesis, which is gonna happen in February 2023. So uh, we're, um, if you'd like also to visit, um, please check it out as well. I think it will be a good meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you.